to you as well. All right. Good. Um, we have a few others on the call, I see. Yes, uh, we have Eric on the call and uh, a couple of my other colleagues. Okay, excellent. We'll just give the other guys a few minutes to pop in and uh, then we'll... Yeah. It's almost like, uh, like having a face-to-face -face meeting because people are still parking their vehicles, coming up the stairs. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly, yeah, uh, traffic, sorry, traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dr. Churchill. You are muted, I can't hear you. Can you unmute? Hi, you can hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. I haven't seen you in quite a while. It's nice to, nice. Meet you. It's nice to see you here. Just you deliver your managed through the crisis that uh, occurred then and then brought some of that into our current COVID uh, situation. And just to see whether things have changed, whether things are still being handled in the, in the same way. So we had an interesting discussion then with the participants, and I'm looking forward to today's discussion as well, where we are discussing the subject of business resilience and how organizations will change to survive post COVID-19. Today, we want to be more forward looking, uh, given that we've been in this space now for the last three months or so. And uh, so we want to look at uh, how organizations uh, are preparing for, for the future. In this webinar today, I'm joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Eric van der Dusen, uh, who um, is one of uh, uh, our, our associates at the leadership group, uh, specifically our expert in strategy and scenario planning, uh, and uh, Dr. Pasio Peo, who is uh, uh, our expert in leadership and ICT transformation. And we shall be sharing the first half hour of this presentation, and thereafter we shall open it up for, for uh, a discussion and to hear your views and experiences as well. Just by way of, uh, of, of housekeeping, um, would like to invite you to use the chat box as much as possible to post your comments and any questions or observations that you may have so that we can, uh, we can talk to those during uh, the, the course of this uh, meeting as well. And um, we will also be running a couple of polls during the course of, um, of this meeting and we shall invite you to participate in those at, at the right time. When you're not um, speaking, please mute your, uh, your mics so that uh, we don't uh, get distracted by other sounds. Uh, but you may leave your, your videos on uh, unless they're impacting your connectivity. So once again, welcome from the Leadership Group. My name is Martin Oduro Tieno. At the Leadership Group, we uh, offer a number of services uh, which are listed on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, executive coaching and, and mentorship, business advisory, which includes uh, strategy uh, development as well as support for strategy implementation, change management, uh, governance and board practice, uh, as well as leadership facilitation. And um, outside of COVID environment, you can find us uh, on, in Western Heights, uh, in Westlands. We haven't actually worked from there over the last three months or so. Uh, we've been uh, working from home, all of us. Uh, Eric is currently in France and he'll be joining us from, from there, uh, the beauty of technology. 
At the leadership group, our mission is all around delivering cutting edge leadership development uh, programs for our clients, um, making leadership a continuous journey of stewardship. We do believe truly that without the right kind of leadership, then organizations and countries cannot uh, develop and move forward. And our core values include the, the value around collaboration. We believe a lot in partnerships. And this is particularly important at this time that we are dealing with the, the COVID pandemic where organizations are realizing that you need to reach out to more and more partners and that alone you may not be able to, uh, to survive. Today's session is going to explore leadership challenges post COVID to um, think through uh, what, uh, how to prepare for strategic uh, change in the future and the digital agenda post uh, COVID-19. I'd like to invite you to just go into your chat boxes very, very quickly and just share with us what your one expectation is out of this session. So if I can give you uh, a few seconds just to go in and type in the chat box what your expectation uh, from this, what is now going to be a, a 45 minute session is going to be. Um, so we shall keep an eye on that. So just uh, quickly type that through. As you do that, I'd like uh, to do a quick poll as well. So Kelly, if you can put up our first poll, which uh, is an assessment of how confident you are on the post COVID-19 recovery of your business operations. So if you can uh, take your level of confidence there, a little confident, I can see. Confidence. Some more. Confidence. Some more. I'd like everybody in the room to uh, take a peek. Right, so I can see that uh, um, People are moving between a little confident and confident. Nobody has gathered uh, enough courage to say very, very confident yet. And it's also interesting, I think it's uh, gratifying to see that nobody is saying that they're not confident at all, which means that as leaders, we truly uh, believe and we are doing something uh, to ensure that uh, uh, our organizations move forward post, uh, post COVID if there's such a thing as post-COVID. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Kelly, can you close that poll and uh, show us the results? Kelly? All right. So 71% of us are confident. 29% uh, are a little confident. So thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, so let me then move on. So just by way of context, uh, we've been now through this for probably three months, four months, uh, you know, going five months. And uh, clearly the word and president has been used many, many times uh, before and everybody has had to learn fast. We, we continue to learn uh, uh, as, as leaders, as organizations, uh, as CEOs. We recognize the fact that uh, the economies are down and the predictions around uh, economic growth rates uh, are, are, are in the negatives. Uh, if we look at our own country, Kenya, uh, from original very optimistic rates of about 6% plus, we are now very close to the 1% uh, level from, from government uh, predictions. And so, um, so that just reflects on what is likely to happen to businesses as well. We've now moved from the initial shock, the initial inertia uh, that, uh, that uh, that accompanied the announcements around COVID and we are thinking very much about how to respond and how to uh, move into the, the era beyond, uh, beyond COVID-19. Um, the crisis management teams and business continuity programs that were set are still in place, but these have now matured as we all know and looking very much at how to rebound. One thing that is important that is, uh, that, that I hear from the different organizations that uh, that interact with 
is very much around strategic plans and strategies being out, um, you know, looking at probably one to three years and, uh, and people are looking much more around shorter term strategies, even as they think about, uh, about the future. This slide says that without courage, we cannot practice any other virtue. So one of the, the real qualities that are demanded of leaders at the moment is, is, is one of courage because, you know, facing very difficult circumstances and having to deal with uh, difficult issues, um, some are a matter of life and death, but some issues about how to, yesterday I was talking to somebody in the evening and he says, you know, Martin, my focus now is to keep my 30 employees with a salary uh, and everything I'm doing is with the eye of keeping my 30 people uh, to uh, ensuring that they're able to put food on their tables for their families as well. So there's a lot of stuff around, around courage. If I just look very briefly at uh, some of the trends uh, shaping leadership, and this is an article that came out uh, when COVID hadn't become a global uh, pandemic but a focus very much on AI and technology and the PASI uh, up here is going to be talking about this uh, shortly. Um, the pace of change has, has uh, uh, really um, speeded um, up. Uh, you know, employees looking for organizations that offer purpose and meaning because this is the time when uh, things like values really come into play. Um, you know, people asking questions as to whether organizations live for profits only or whether they live for a purpose. Uh, and and, and that is, uh, that's an important thing that we are seeing. The new talent landscape, uh, striving to uh, develop diverse teams and the concept of teamwork very much into play, uh, especially when people are working from home and you can no longer walk around the office and, and find them and tap them on the shoulder. The whole area of ethics and transparency uh, as well as technology uh, through globalization. So these are some of the trends that we are seeing more and more. They were there before COVID, but COVID has accelerated a lot of this. If we look at what's happening in the workplaces, uh, a lot of uh, flexibility around working from home, uh, organizations enabling their staff to, to, to work, providing equipment and facilities, and um, you know, people having to ensure that they, are, they have within their homes a desk that uh, they can use as they carry out the work. Um, if I just think about myself, the first two weeks, I actually thought I was on holidays. So I was really doing nothing. I was basking, getting a lot of vitamin D. But after the first two weeks, I realized that actually I needed to be doing something and therefore very quickly had to come back to that uh, reality. Uh, and some of these that you see here, business attire, you know, office space and how we use office space in the future, the whole concept about e-learning, very much uh, a big part of, uh, of our lives uh, today. And I've mentioned earlier speed, uh, speed of innovation, uh, speed of recovery uh, as things which are fundamental to, to us as leaders to think about as a position for the long term and, uh, and, and to get ahead of competition. This week, I've been attending uh, a, a Pan-African conference and uh, Dennis Awori, whom some of, some of you will, will know, was a guest speaker yesterday. And I picked up some of the themes as he was talking about transformative leadership. Themes around uh, leadership that recognizes and embraces the digital era, uh, including rapid change uh, and speed of innovation. Uh, leadership that anchors performance on balancing profit recovery with sustainability, a leadership that works with teams that identifies the needed change and executes that change through committed team members, even if they're not working in the same physical space, and a leadership that embraces agility and accountability. Uh, We're looking at business models, and Eric will talk briefly about this just now, and also accelerating digital systems. I want to show a very quick uh, video clip here from uh, uh, one of the, uh, by Bain actually, Bain Consulting, that talks about uh, some three key elements uh, that, that leaders see in a transformative, in a, in a post-COVID period. And just listen to them, I hope the, the volume comes through properly. Uh, 
It's Hi only there, three Tom minutes. Holland, a partner in Bain, San Francisco, and a leader of our transformation practice worldwide. As you can see, I'm actually sitting in an office today, and most of this month, I'm working on a special project for one of Bain's healthcare clients, trying to help them ramp up one of the medical solutions to COVID-19. So it's a very exciting project, and it does have me in their offices with the SWAT team working on this day to day. I wanted to share some thoughts about how companies are responding to this crisis. And I'm particularly focused on companies that are not the ones that were very distressed early on, but that may see challenges ahead in the coming months and quarters based on the macroeconomic scenario. So while there are a few companies that were super distressed, airlines, hotels, et cetera, and actually some growing companies right now, it's all the companies in the middle where I think the management teams are really wrestling with how to deal with this crisis financially. And we're encouraging them to do three things over the coming weeks. One is rigorous scenario planning, where we all have seen the macro story of the disease and what might be happening to the economy in terms of unemployment. And we're really encouraging companies to take those possible macro scenarios, which we believe will be ongoing for quarters. It'll take many quarters probably to recover from just where we are today economically and run those through your business and think about what that's going to do to your demand, your revenue line, and not to try to pick a point estimate. It's impossible to do that in the environment we're in, but rather to think about scenarios that are wide ranging and include fairly distressed down situations that would be depressed demand for many quarters, but run those through your P&L, your cash model, and really think about point two, what actions do we need to take? Not just today, but what might we need to be ready for you know, for the next nine months? And a cascaded, if you will, set of possible actions to manage your cost line, manage your P&L, and for businesses that get distressed, manage your cash and liquidity. And then third is, uh, and it's a little bit of a happier thought, but begin to think about the recovery and which might be months in the future, but as you begin to see demand recover in your business, you know, what are the things that have changed during this crisis, this downturn, that really could be leading you to new ways of working in the future? And so I'm thinking about things like knowing that most of your employees are able to work remote, unless they're operationally hands-on. You know, do we need all the real estate we have? Thinking about, downturn and the recovery and think about what you want your business to look like a year from today. So those are my thoughts and uh, I hope each of you is uh, doing the best you can and doing well in this time period. Thanks. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would now like to invite uh, Eric. Uh, we'll come back to reflect on that, uh, on that video clip uh, later, but uh, Eric, uh, would you like to come on and to share your screen? If you could unmute Eric. Yes, thank you, Martin. Um, if I look at sharing screen, if you give me one second. Bit of challenge here. Yeah. Uh, sh shall I put back mine, Eric? If you give me one second. Give me one second. Yes, I'll share my screen. Here we go. Here we go. Thank you. Sorry for that. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I was really looking forward to this session because. Um, I mean, um, every day we, we feel and we live and we work in, in this uh, new reality. And um, people are struggling with so many things. Uh, there's also a lot uh, published. There are a lot of webinars about it. And what intrigues me actually is um, when we're all through this, when this is all done, uh, what will be, what will have changed? 
what will be a real change? What will be um, the future point um, where companies will be operating in? And what, what will be new actually, uh, away from the normal? So um, there's a few slides I made to, to structure this thought process, uh, process and to come up with these points of change. Uh, first of all, um, let's call COVID-19 an earthquake. Um, and um, it has many effects that drive change. Uh, of course, the econo ec economical, with, with um, companies closing or reducing their revenues or uh, having, having logistic, um, logistic challenges in their supply chain, which, which um, affects actually their business very hard, very bad. Um, then, of course, there's a social aspect to it. You need to adapt to your new, to your new environment. Um, this, this, all, all, everything that's going on is, is, is reason for reflection. Um, and the main clue actually is that uh, what has worked in the recent past will most probably not work in the near future. So, so there's many drivers for change. And um, uh, you can talk about a dis disorientation. And wh what I think is the main point um, in everything, in, in all those drivers and in all business teams, is the uncertainty. The uncertainty that, that um, is all around us because we don't know exactly what is next and what is where next. So one conclusion for, for scenario uh, planning is that um, it becomes far more, far more relevant. Uh, scenario planning is a way to deal with uncertainties and to look at um, ways how to behave within those, 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 those dimensions and change them in time. Um, that will be the focus of, of uh, strategy and we'll come to it in my last slide. Again, uh, the uncertainty, um, if you're disoriented and if you're uncertain, you, 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 you actually uh, will start to, to um, think, act and plan differently than you were before. Um, so what is what is changing? What do we see? Um, if you if you look at all the all the um, big consultancy houses uh, websites and, and what they advise and how they publish and, and or you go to to the Harvard Business Review, um, they all talk about uh, three dimensions or three horizons. I, I believe that the Bain gentleman that we just saw in the video video is doing the same. It's the here and now to secure your business security, a continuity. It's, it, 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 it's a struggle, it's a bit panicking, it's, it's uh, what do we do? Uh, once you've, you've got there and things are getting clear, when the fog is gone, people need to reset, to recover from, from all events. And um, if we look at the future, which is much referred to uh, getting back to the new normal, uh, what, looking at that future is a challenge, not only because it's, it's insecure, but, but more that, it's difficult to get at. Um, if the example of, 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 of that Martin gave of someone just trying to keep his, 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 his employees in, something else than looking at, okay, how will the new future look for as far as we know and what will be the real changes? Now, um, if you read um, about this new normal you, and, 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 and you visit those sites or the newsletters or the webinars, a, a term I saw quite often was back to the new normal. Now, I think we shouldn't use that term and I don't think it's relevant because first of all, it's about going forward, not back. Uh, imagining, the, imagining the unnormal is far more relevant than, than the normal. And um, the big opportunity is to also say, if we look ahead, if we go to a new point, what do we want to leave behind? What um, will be out? And, and um, like, like, like um, slow decision-making structures like frustrating talent, like hierarchy that doesn't work and doesn't contribute any value, uh, like positions that are taken for 20 years without a reason of adding value. So th there's a lot, a lot you can leave behind um, in the current transition that uh, is happening for everybody. And there won't be any new, new normal. Um, uh, a wise man currently said uh, to me, a crisis will come and go forever. So don't think that COVID-19 is, is the last crisis we have to deal with. And look, look at your recent past. Um, we had Ebola, we had in Kenya, the, the very dry period last year. We had the elections problems, which we will probably have in two years again. 
Um, we had a financial crisis. I think what I've just told you was in a time frame of the past seven years. So um, there will not be a normal. Um, you will be stay. You need to stay agile for this for this uh, future. Um, so here, here I, 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 I write the points that, that that I've discovered and that I've thought about about what will really change actually. And there are in many areas, clearly efficiency, uh, looking at your, your cost structure and your cost anyway, because um, uh, companies are getting in trouble. Your operating model redesign is, is important, so we must be get far more agile and flexible, a lot of companies, than they are now to, to be prepared. The PPP emphasis is an interesting one. Um, modern companies that are aware of their environment uh, focus at the balance of profit, people, and the planet. Now the people and the planet have become more important. Um, so um, I think the emphasis will be driven on that area. Um, enterprise risk management will be revisited and be made more important. The continuity plan, as where Martin referred to, are, are very important. You, you might even have the, the, the enterprise risk management looking into your uh, operating model to be more flexible. Flex, flexible technology, Percy um, will we'll talk about it. Is of course um, a, a will have a big change. It will, will be more important. It, it, it will be and imagine uh, the current crisis without technology. Um, that is that is um, where would we have been without technology? Uh, and, and the developments are, are going very fast in that area. So if you look at the strategy, as said. Um, one thing about HR, there's several interesting things about HR, what will change if you look what Anderson says, for example, is that um, companies will join together to have pools and, and, and work with, the, with one pool of people so that they don't have to hire everyone uh, themselves. Um, working in uncertain times uh, from home or from anywhere uh, might also uh, need different kind of resources than you than you have now, but what I think that will really change is the relationship between employer and employee. Um, if, if, I, if I if I look around, um, if there's many employees still that expect to have a certain future or certainty uh, from their from their employer, that is changing. Um, there's one of my own ex-employees in Kenya that. Uh, has um, got 25% uh, of, the, of, of the salaries of everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, at the same time, you see them all moving around on LinkedIn looking, looking for new jobs. So I think that um, flex workers in different relationships, uh, different than just hired, hired people with fixed contracts, will be a, a clear uh, change in, in the future on horizon three. Um, talking about strategy, um, that's my last point within my time limit of this quick presentation. Um, so scenario planning uh, becomes far, very relevant for the, for the strategy department. If you look at the current scenarios that are much published, it's along two lines. Uh, one, how will this, this virus actually develop? Will it stay or go? Uh, Will it be a, a small second wave or not? Uh, and how does the government deal with it, uh, adequate or not? And within these frames, there's all kinds of scenarios. Those are for Horizon 1 or 2. I think that the dimensions for Horizon 3 will be different. I think what will be very interesting is um, how, what will the impact be on the people? Um, so both as consumers, as employees, Will the current crisis change them in their consumer patterns? Uh, will they find out that it's not about making the max money you can? Will they come up with, with new values? That is one dimension of future scenarios. How do people want to work in the future? What relationships do they want with the entities they work with? Um, I think that is one thing we really need to look at. And um, the other um, scenario will, of course, be um, the, the, the globalization. I mean, uh, where what effect will the COVID have on the globalization? Because um, 
it might be that that um, production and, and, and work and, and other things will be get far more within country borders than crossing it. And if you take those two together, um, economies might be smaller and um, which if people might um, be happy with, with, with other things than, than just money or, or prestige or status. And that might also really tune the purpose of companies. So there's, there's several dimensions to look at that uh, strategy and, and scenario planning. Um, but, but that will be the key for future scenario planning. Um, and in the end, um, it's, uh, it's a, much used, a much used quote from uh, Charles Darwin, but it's all about um, to be responsive to change. That is so much an emphasis now. Every, every company is feeling it each day. And um, um, again, um, if, we, if we don't think about uh, going back, but going forward to, to get responsive to change, there's a lot of things we can leave behind. And I hope that that will inspire everyone here present in, uh, in the webinar, Martin. Thank you very much, um, uh, Eric, uh, for, for, for that. Um, let me just come back to, uh, as I welcome, uh, as I welcome Pasi, uh, let me just, uh, A minute, um, Kelly. I'd like you to put up your um, that poll, uh, and then just get a sense from uh, the participants here um, around their strategy processes. How much will the way strategies developed and implemented in your company change in the post-COVID uh, nineteen period? Um, we use the word post-COVID period, but we are actually not sure whether there's a post-COVID period um, uh, significantly. So just take the one that best describes what your strategy process are going to be like. I can see a lot of scores for significantly and somewhat. All right. Yeah, so as, as, as um, as you can see, um, you know, the whole process around strategy development and implementation uh, is not going to stay the same. And uh, that is, that's just a reality and it helps reinforce what Eric has just been talking about. So um, thank you very much for, for that. Let me then uh, move on. Pasi, do you want to share your screen? Yes, Martin, let me share my screen. Thank All you. right. Right. So Pasi is, um, uh, is, is, uh, is, is a member of our leadership group team and his area of expertise is uh, leadership and technology. So Pasi, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. And I want to start from... Uh, from this slide, this is uh, an analysis that was done by Black Morgan on uh, the current customer experience mindset as a result of uh, COVID-19. And uh, they came up with seven issues that customers are actually going through right now. Uh, the first one is uh, we're, we're in a traumatized society. We're all traumatized because of COVID. The containment, uh, the fact that we are unable to go about business the way we, we are used to. There's anxiety and emotional impact just because people are staying at home, not interacting. 19% uh, 19, 19 for example, worry about running out of money. So if, as much as you're earning money right now, the, the fact is some, some people are wondering for how long they'll continue earning money. Then we have uh, consumer trust is a big problem where they say 71% say that if a brand is putting profit before people right now, they'll drop it immediately because the focus right now is on uh, empathy. Uh, consumer spending has shifted to, to, to online shopping because many people are contained or, or under lockdown. 
and uh, and life still has to go on. Uh, it's interesting that in the past three months, uh, uh, online uh, shopping has grown the fastest uh, as compared to the other the, 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 the period in the past. Then we are also employee expectations. We have 36% saying that, they, that they'd want to continue working from home after the pandemic period. It's very interesting because this 36% this are already in the new normal and we'll have to readjust to working in the office if, if they ever are asked to. Then we have uh, uh, technology. There's a lot of demand for digital transformational technology right now. Uh, people like Facebook, Amazon, Google are hiring, while other, other organizations seem to be going through uh, downsizing. So technology is, 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 on, is on high demand right now. Uptake of robotics for manufacturing, for customer service, artificial intelligence is also on the rise. Then we have a few companies that are thriving just because of COVID. I mean, many, many people are watching Netflix or are watching uh, or, or using Amazon and they say the shares are going up. Locally, I believe uh, any, any organization that is, is, is in the business of providing data and internet access should be, should be thriving in, in one way or another. Then there's a new appreciation for normal life. People are beginning to appreciate what they refer to as normal life in the past. So from a customer experience perspective, uh, this is the mindset of our customers and probably the mindset of, of all of us uh, in, 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 in this webinar. So I'd want us to go forward to the next slide and look at the, sorry, my slides are not moving. I don't know why. Yeah, this is it, sorry. This is what, I, that, that what we see as the ideal post COVID digital transformation scenario. And I use the word ideal intentionally here because we, we expect to see a lot of digital collaboration going on. We've seen it happening in businesses, in uh, religious sectors, in uh, social interaction between families also. Uh, we, we expect to see a lot of online shop, shopping because of e-commerce, B2B and, uh, and, 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 and customer to business. Um, Self-service, we expect to see digital uh, self-service uh, solutions going on, uh, increasing, especially in e-government, uh, because now we don't need, we don't have to walk to government for a service. Government has, 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 has literally shut down 50% of uh, uh, their functions. So we expect digital payments to also go up. That, that is a reality that uh, is in Kenya. Uh, digital banking, why should we walk into the banking hall? and risk ourselves getting infected. Then e-learning, all our schools are closed. So the expectation is that students will all be on an e-learning platform, learning and uh, uh, with, with learning going on uninterrupted. Then from a manufacturing and a service industry, we expect to see robotics. I mean, people are at home. We expect to see investment in robotics so that business continues. And for healthcare, it's telemedicine. It's very interesting in healthcare because uh, uh, I interacted with a few doctors some, some week, uh, a few weeks ago and they also feel vulnerable. So some doctors have pulled back and said they'll work from home because in the vulnerable age, they do not want to get uh, infected. So telemedicine and teleconsult is what we expect to happen in the ideal post COVID-19 transformational scenario. But that's the ideal. What I want us to look at now is from our own local context. There's some barriers to digital transformation. As much as we want to move ahead, there's some barriers that, ex that exist. One of them is access to technology. Whether it's because of infrastructure, our telcos are not yet, our, are not yet covering the entire country with a 3G or a 4G network or affordability. Yes, we have smartphones, but the reality is that uh, people do not want to buy data to use for mobile banking or for shopping or, because data is, is still, still has to be, to be made affordable. Appropriate innovations. We're innovating a lot on the smartphones, but there's a, there's a, there's a good number of people who still have uh, feature phones. 
and that technology has to be appropriate for them to participate in the digital transformation. SMEs are not yet all digitally online. They still are affected. Then we are from a social perspective. Do we still trust digital platforms? Some people don't trust digital uh, platforms and will not shop online. They still want to do it physically. And the trauma that we're going through that, um, that uh, because of COVID also affects uh, our uptake of digital transformation solutions. Then a big one also is mind response mindsets. Many organizations are implementing solutions as a response to COVID-19, which is short term, as opposed to being uh, as, as a strategic response with a long term uh, focus. And, and that's where you'll find many of even our, our schools are at the moment. There's some schools that are purely going for free solutions, uh, Google uh, Classroom, using WhatsApp, purely as a response to COVID in, with, 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 with the belief that this period will end and everybody will be back in the classroom. So these are what we found as barriers to the digital transformation. And because of these, there are two scenarios that uh, we foresee, especially in our local context and Africa in general. We'll have a digitally transformed landscape on one end, and we'll have a, dig a, a big digital divide between those who have uh, adopted digitization and those who have not. And this is, this is very clearly seen. If I start with uh, uh, all these sectors like manufacturing, there are very few that are investing in uh, uh, automated technology to, to mitigate the risk of, uh, of reliance on, uh, on, 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 on human beings. If you look at uh, online shopping, the supermarkets are still packed. When you go to a supermarket in Kenya in the afternoon, it's still full of people walking into the supermarket. Yet there's some of us who have adopted uh, 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 online shopping and get uh, our goods delivered at home. If you look at churches and the religious sector, there are some that are online and there are some that are completely cut out from being online. And even if they wanted to, the infrastructure and access to technology does not allow them to. Financial services industry also, there are some who will be uh, completely digital, but some who will be left behind. In education, it's very interesting because while private schools are haggling with parents over uh, e-learning and uh, what parents should pay for, for e-learning, uh, public schools are completely shut down. There's no discussion about uh, e-learning. So that's a big digital divide. So we have some private schools going on with the teaching online and a majority of the population is still at home with no learning happening at all. And this can be felt in almost every sector, all the way to the service industry. So as much as yes, we're saying that uh, yes, COVID will trigger a digital transformation uh, and a digital transformational customer experience, in our market, we're going to see a big divide if this goes on for quite a while. An exception is in mobile money, because we still have, uh, I mean, Safaricom have, uh, for example, have reduced their, their charges and said anything below a thousand bob is free to transact. So there might be an increase in our digital payments, and that may be the biggest adoption, probably is the biggest adoption of digital uh, transformational solutions in our market. So from an opportunistic perspective, organizations that uh, have customers like who are SMEs, for example, the financial services sector, it's an opportunity to bring SMEs on board with digital platforms and uh, co interconnect their networks through uh, uh, an e-commerce e platform. So from a technological perspective, Martin, that's what uh, uh, we foresee going forward. Thank you very much, Pasi. That's, uh, that's really interesting, especially when you spoke about education and public there, yeah, that really brought it home, uh, that digital divide that some children are in school, whereas the vast majority of, uh, of students are actually at home because there's no enabling uh, technology and framework uh, for that. So that is quite, uh, uh, quite uh, a state there, uh, which should really concern us. Uh, let's um, let's uh, as we come towards the, the the open session now. I just want you to go into into the chat box, and um, in one line, uh, just 
you know, uh, record there what change digital transformation is bringing to the way you deliver to your customers. Um, if you could just uh, go in there and scribble what change digital transformation is bringing to the way you deliver to your customers. I know that in the audience, we are, we've got a number of people in the hospitality industry. We've got a number of people in the strategy space. We've got a number of people uh, in the education space. Uh, if you can go into the chat box and just write a sentence there about uh, how digital transformation is changing the way you deliver to your customers. As you do that, uh, I'd also like us to run a very, very quick uh, poll here. Uh, so Kelly, if you can put that up. Your business is adopting new digital solutions to deliver products and services to your customers. Not at all, somewhat or significantly. If you could just go in and uh, click on the right one. All right, so again, we can see here that uh, uh, your businesses large, by and large are adopting new digital solutions. You can see 100%, there's nobody who is being left behind here. That's because of some of the realities that have been talked about by uh, both Percy and, uh, and Eric. So thank you, uh, Kelly, you can, uh, you can close that. So just before I open up, a couple of things that I just wanted to call out uh, on, on this subject of business re resilience. Certainly, the space of uh, developing trust-based cultures with employees, given that you are not sitting with them in the same space necessarily all the time as you used to. Remote working becoming very, very strategic. The way that people engage, that leadership engages people is really critical and we've seen it uh, even where leadership has had to deliver uh, bad news about uh, layoffs or salary cuts as we said leadership is learning to deliver this with empathy uh, with real concern for the people and uh, we're hearing statements like even if we let you go we shall look after you uh, the best leaders will break out of silos and improve work, workplace culture. So there's a lot around people, even in this, uh, in this new environment that we are finding ourselves, uh, ourselves in. I know that we've, uh, we're coming close to our uh, two o'clock stop, but we, had started, we started off about 10 minutes late. I'd like to allow some time for, uh, for questions or comments. And uh, I'll just go into the into the chat box and just see if we've got some uh, questions that have come through there. Um, yeah, so uh, Ashton is asking, you know, how do we create culture and organizational vitality uh, without uh, without face to face? I'd like, uh, I mean, what what comes to the top of my mind here really is that as, as Eric said, you know, uh, things have moved on and therefore uh, creativity in developing new ways of, of mimicking face to face. So we're on this webinar, for example, um, we can see one another, we can adopt, uh, we can adopt pro practices which ensure that every day we've got, we are checking in or checking out of our staff, uh, having very regular conversations, um, you know, and, and just ensuring that even though they are working remotely, we, still, we are still connected through the ways that we develop. And if I just take an example of the leadership group, which is uh, the, 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 the company that is running this webinar now, uh, Prior to COVID, we really uh, were in the same space and we didn't, we didn't really concern, were not really concerned about having regular team meetings, et cetera, because I could walk around and see everybody and talk to them in their work spaces. Today, we've got uh, very, very regular interactions on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, every, every week, every day, we are calling on one another, checking 
you know, how we're doing health-wise. Uh, you know, Kelly had a birthday yesterday and we had, we're all celebrating her birthday, although we haven't, uh, we're not in the same face-to-face space. So I guess it just, it just calls for social interactions in a different way uh, than, than where we have been before. I saw a question here earlier on, which was talking about, uh, 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 again from Hush Ashton, how do you see flex working being possible in countries with restrictive employment legislation or strong unions? Eric, I don't know if you've got, if you want, if you can make any comment on this particular one. Yes, yes, I can. It's, it's a good point, uh, Ashton. And it will indeed uh, be very different per continent and, and uh, per country. Uh, I, I do think it, it, it will happen. Actually, when uh, actually it was at the end of last century when when internet was coming up and e-commerce and everything it was already predicted that um, employee employer relations will, will will change. I still think that um, it will be fast tracked uh, with with the current. Uh, situation and, and following because the employer can can offer less and less uh, value to the employee so the employee will be stronger and the relation will become looser looser um, less as in less fixed uh, and yeah with with a lot of changes um, especially all, you have seen the same in uh, technology the the government and legislation and unions are not the most visionary and, and will follow and will will slow things down. Um, but um, my prediction is that uh, these relationships and and the flex working and employees adding adding value also being more self aware and seeing more options as a result of of the current earthquake will be encouraged. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Eric. Um, in the chat box, there's a number of other comments, uh, and a lot of it is really around uh, uh, around this working from home and the impact of technology. Uh, so, just going back to the topic of today's webinar, which is around business resilience, uh, it is indeed true that uh, part of the resilience of business is going to be very much dependent on the way that uh, organisations and leaders like yourselves um, focus on the on the people side of your businesses, uh, even as you, uh, you know, how you're looking after the people that remain. Uh, and again, as we said earlier, acceleration of the digital uh, journey and, and, and innovation. Um, let me pause there. If anybody has got any final closing words that, uh, that you want to, uh, to share with us before we, before we close. Um, I'm just checking in the chat box again. If not, then uh, I'd like you to take our final poll today, which is uh, how do you rate the content and delivery of this webinar? Uh, if you can go, Kelly, if you can put that up um, and if you can quickly tick your choice there. Uh, um, satisfactory, good. Right, right, great. So thank you very much. Um, at the leadership group, as we said earlier, uh, what we try and do is to try and interact with our, our clients uh, in a way that uh, we're sharing what it is that uh, is current. And I do hope that uh, today has not been uh, different as we've gone through this, uh, this webinar. Uh, clearly, uh, the, uh, that resilience that, that is the topic of today's webinar is going to, to be critical for all of us. So I invite you to um, pick the uh, learnings from today and take them forward in your organizations. I also want to invite you to our next webinar, which is going to be on the subject of value creation for sustainable business. And this will be taking place on Tuesday, 7th of July, at the same time at two o'clock. Um, and uh, Kelly is going to be sending out to you invitations as well. And watch out on our LinkedIn page, uh, as well as on our other communication. 
So, so 7th of July, uh, Tuesday, value creation for sustainable business. And again, we'll have a team of experts who will be sharing uh, thoughts on this, uh, on this subject. So that, uh, and again, I'm being reminded that we shall share with you uh, in materials from this, uh, from this webinar today so that you can continue to reflect on them even as you continue with your business. So I don't want to keep you uh, much longer than the promised time of, uh, of two o'clock. So I'd just like to say on behalf of uh, the leadership group, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope that you found this useful and we look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar. Have a good day, stay safe, and bye-bye. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good afternoon.